would like to thank, of course, the organizers. Uh, it's wonderful to be in what a great city this is. I've talked to so many people who just find this city so charming and so wonderful. And most of us have not been here before, so it's just a wonderful opportunity. I'd like to thank Sarah. She, you know, she's uh, answered every single one of my somewhat ridiculous emails in such a quick way, so thank you. And uh, this meeting has been so well organized. It's really fantastic. Um, so, uh, this is my group. This picture's a couple years old. I want to introduce a couple people here. First, there's, I don't know if this laser pointer works. Okay. Anyway, Anton Petrov is there. Um, and, but he's back here, so you'll meet him later. Uh, so I don't have to introduce him. Um, but I would like to introduce you to Peter. Peter is one of my former graduate students who grew up right here in this town and was a very talented scientist who was doing a postdoc um, with uh, Jill Manfield out at Berkeley right now. And I think you should try to get him back here. He's, uh, um, he'll be on the market in a few years, and uh, you should look for him. That's Peter right there. Um, okay, so this is. Uh, this is actually my second back-to-back -back meeting on sort of the same topic. There was a NASA organized meeting organized by Jennifer Glass and uh, Zach Adams, which dealt with a lot of the same topics as this. I was just at that meeting last week, and now there's this one this week. So I wanted to, I'm going to I've thrown away my sort of normal talk, and I'm going to try to synthesize some of the things I've heard and learned from these meetings and uh, kind of present them back. So excuse me if my talk is a little bit ad hoc and try to put some things together. So one of the things I have learned is there's a lot of physicists, number one. Number two, most of them seem to be from Harvard. And three, they love the second law, and they love Schrodinger. And uh, physicists like to talk about life, Schrodinger, and the second law. I've noticed that. Um, so I've been thinking about this, and I have to tell you that for me as a biochemist, I don't find it so helpful. I mean, I believe in the second law, but when I look at biology, this thing about biology sort of spewing out disorder, is, I just don't find it helpful. And I've been thinking about this, and I want to try to explain to you sort of some of the issues with that. So I guess I'm talking to the physicist, but I need to be humble. I'm not a physicist. So I, mean, I just want to start here. If you crystallize something like, let's say glycine, it's pretty easy, or sucrose. You can do this in your kitchen. Right? You just put glucose in water, you can evaporate it, and you can get rid of beautiful crystals. But add something else to it. Like you could add Tabasco sauce, or salt, or something else, and it won't work. Okay? You can do this with pure materials, but you cannot do this with mixtures. And I'm a recovering crystallographer, I spent a lot of my life trying to grow crystals, and uh, you know, homogeneity is so critical. You've got to start with a pure protein or you will never get a crystal, right? So this thing I'm showing you here, notice that the, it's a positive delta G, the arrow is pushing it. You cannot crystallize a heterogeneous mixture. It's not possible. Unless you're biology, then you can do this, right? You hook them together, and now look at the direction, the delta G turned from positive to negative, all of a sudden you can do this. All right, so I've been, I think I made this figure and I'm just sort of fascinated, like I've been switching it back and forth looking at this thing. It's like some kind of thermodynamic parlor trick, right? You're taking something that cannot happen and you're making it spontaneous. What is this? How does this work? This is, in fact, this we call this protein folding. And we said protein folding is spontaneous, right? The delta G of protein folding is spontaneous. So we can build things in biology, but we can't, we can't build them with monomers. So one of the questions we should ask, I think, in this field is like, what, does biology need polymers, and why do we need polymers? And I think, yes, biology needs polymers, and this kind of, this shows you why biology needs polymers. You can build things with polymers that you cannot build without polymers. And then once you've got this, then the whole world is your oyster. Right, you can do, you can do anything. Right? Once you can control assembly in this way, you can do anything. So when you look at biology, you know, this is what you see. This is what comes out of this. And um, I just pulled these out of the PDP. They have this great library. And, uh, but this is a little bit biased, I realize, because 
we like symmetry, and I notice I picked out a lot of symmetric things, but biology does, it can build, like, if you look at the ribosome, you know, molecular weight millions, 50 proteins, thousands of nucleotides, it assembles beautifully. There's no symmetry there, right? So, uh, you know, there's a lot of symmetry in these molecules, but that's really not necessary. So, what is this? It looks like biology has some trick that allows it to, to do some things that, that normal physical processes cannot do. And I, I do believe that's, that's true. I mean, obviously, you kind of don't believe that, but I think this thermodynamic thing is part of it. And so this is what, I'm just thinking about this, I wrote this out last night, trying to think, why does this happen? Number one, in biology, there's something called an energy currency. And this is a thing particular to biology. And uh, the way to think about it is, this, this I guess, oh, oh, okay, I'll read these off. You know, ATP hydrolysis is exothermic, right? You dump out, you can hydrolyze ATP and harvest that energy. And uh, ATP hydrolysis is linked to thousands of reactions in a cell, literally. And, and so what that means is anything can be pushed uphill. In a cell, anything can be pushed uphill because it can be linked to ATP hydrolysis. And the, the weird thing about ATP is that its synthesis is not linked to those things. It's kind of like you have a machine over against the wall, and that's just spitting out ATP, and then you can use it for whatever you want. So biology takes oxygen, reduced carbon, transfers the electrons from the carbons to the oxygen, and it uses that to make ATP, and then the ATP can be used for all kinds of things that have nothing to do with that. And, uh, and another interesting thing about ATP, which we should all sort of keep in the back of our mind, is the, the, the concentration of ATP in a cell is higher than it needs to be. Like you can look at the KDs of all these uh, enzymes and things and say, okay, you need this much KD to do this much ATP to make this reaction work. There's way more ATP. The concentration of ATP in a cell is much higher than it needs to be. So I guess the way to think about it is, I want to buy a sandwich and there's just $10 bills floating around in the air and I can just grab a $10 bill and go buy a sandwich. I don't, I don't have to worry about where the $10 came from. That's, that's what's going on in biology. Um, I mean, actually, I've been talking, Eric and Anton and I have been talking about this for a while, and I guess the way I would think about this is, and this is an analogy, maybe it's not a very good analogy, but, you know, in, in a very primitive economy, you have like a barter system, right? I want your chicken, you want my potatoes, we can do that transfer. But in a modern economy, we have these financial instruments. We have, well, we have a currency, right? We have credit cards. We can take loans. We can do all this thing with money. I mean, still, in the end, all the money has to add up, presumably. So, you know, the, the rules of thermodynamics apply. But I think, maybe this is a way to think about it. I don't know what you guys think. Is that biology, there are things called thermodynamic instruments. Like a, a currency, an energy currency, is a thermodynamic instrument. And you could say the universal universality of glucose. Everything alive shares glucose, right? So that would be a thermodynamic instrument. And there's many, many thermodynamic instruments that biology uses that I think are not available to the world outside of biology. I just made this up last night, so. But I, but I think that, I, basically what I'm saying is I think we need a theory of biothermodynamics because I don't think the rules of thermodynamics really allow us to understand biology. I think we have to step beyond that. And I don't think that's been done. Oh, there's another thing, of course, evolution. You know, what is evolution really? Evolution is like harvesting energy four billion years ago and taking that, you know, finding out these sequences through some, the sun is shining, you know, the entropy of the universe increases, you find those sequences, and then those sequences are cemented forever and they are replicated. And that, that thermodynamic investment from billions of years ago is used right here, right now, today by fragile organic molecules that have a lifetime of 100 years. I mean, it's kind of a fantastical thing. So even a theory of sort of th the thermodynamics of evolution or the evolution of thermodynamics, I think, is something that we should be thinking about. Okay, so that's one of my topics. I have like three or four things I'm going to go over from, that I've learned from these meetings. The other one, is about habitable zones. People have been talking about habitable zones here, and I want to sort of switch topics totally and talk about habitable zones. And 
What I want you to focus on here is the water. And uh, I want to talk about water. And we've already talked about water, actually. Um, Sutherland just said, I don't think life originated in a thermal vent. And Catlin said the same thing. And uh, you know, several, several people have said this, that too much water is not good, because things in biology are not so dynamically stable in water. They'll just hydrolyze, right? So we need to, water, you know, as far as a habitable zone, we need water, but maybe we don't need too much water. And so and I agree totally uh, with all of that, that, you know, water is an important part of life, but water, too much water <coughs> is, is a problem. I want to, but I want to talk about this a little bit, because um, I want to think carefully about water. So, we've already, several speak, this has already gone over, but you know, water has these special properties, right? We, we've talked about that in this meeting. Um, my graduate student's mother told me about this today, yesterday, that water has special properties. And uh, high, you know, high heat capacity, all these things. And one of them, of course, is the, uh, is the hydrophobic effect. You know, actually, it's funny. The entropy should increase when you mix things, right? If you have red marbles and blue marbles, you shake them together, they're not going to ever spontaneously unmix, right? There should be an entropy gain. The universe gains entropy when you mix things. But now with oil and water, you can mix oil and water, and they will spontaneously unmix. And this is not a property of the oil. This is the water. The water pushes the oil out. And this is known as a hydrophobic effect. And the hydrophobic effect is the reason why proteins fold, is why membranes assemble, and all that stuff. So, uh, this has been said already. Water is the medium of biology. We have a very hard time imagining. It doesn't mean biology needs water on some other planet, but we have a very hard time imagining what that would be. So we think of water as a biosignature. But I, I don't think this is the whole story. That's what I want to do. I want to tell you something else about water. But before I do that, because I'm a biochemist, I want to talk about enzyme mechanisms. And every student needs to understand serine protease mechanism. We make our students memorize this mechanism. And I want to show you this mechanism because I love serine proteases. So we're walking through this mechanism. Peptide bond gets cleaved. And then a water molecule comes in. And it's gone. That water molecule went away. Where is that water molecule? That water molecule becomes part of a carboxylic acid, right? So, that, so water is the medium bio, of biology, but it's also a chemical participant in biology. It's not just the medium. It's like something far beyond the medium. It is a, it is a chemical participant. And a few years ago, some, some of us in my lab, Moran Frankel Pinter and uh, a group of us, we decided we needed to quantitate this. What, what does this really mean that water is a chemical participant in biology? So this is a paper that came out of that, but what we did is we went through the EC database. This is all the enzymatic reactions that are known in biology. And we looked at every mechanism, and we counted the number of water molecules. We said, how many of these things use water as a substrate or a product? And uh, it was hard because there's a lot, there's thousands of these reactions, and it's also hard because the mechanisms of many of these reactions are not actually known in a lot of detail. So, but anyway, we did, we counted it, and it turns out, really, it's safe to say that most reactions in biochemistry involve water in a covalent sense, just like the serine protease, right? That water doesn't disappear, it's covalently converted to something else. And this is the, so water is not just a, it's not the medium of biology. It is one of the. It is the primary substrate. Like for example, this is how you make essentially any polymer. You make it by producing water, and you that, that's called condensation. And then you break it by hydrolysis. So when you make and break things in biology, you're doing covalent reactions with water. And uh, this is showing making a peptide, making a nucleotide making a polysaccharide. I mean, this applies to, to polymers and you know, NAD, FAD, all these things. When you make them, there's water involved. So, in fact, so this is how we started to think about biology. We have a, people generally look at this thing on the right and say, you know, what's a metabolite? 
Glutamate's the dominant metabolite. There's more glutamate in the cell than anything else. But really, the main metabolite, if you want to call it a metabolite, is water. Everything else in biology is just, and I'm talking about by concentration in the cell. We're looking at concentration in the cell. The dominant metabolite, or I don't know, you don't know what to call it, right? Is it water a metabolite, or what is it? But it is something that is consumed and produced in biochemical reactions, and on a, on a molar basis, it dominates everything else by massive, massive amount. And so then we thought about, okay, what about the average water? And really, you know, in our, we can sort of count this and we did some kind of cheap math and the average water molecule in an E. coli is involved in some chemical transformation about every three to five minutes. So you have a huge number of water molecules in an E. coli and every three to five minutes it is being used for hydrolysis, being, you know, the water molecule is just covalently participating uh, in an incredible sense in biological systems. So the main thing, you know, water, yeah, water is the medium of biology, but that's just the tip of water is the dominant chemical participant in biology. And, and we don't actually have a, a way to describe this. We don't, have a, we don't have a language to describe what water is. There's no solvent. It's not a solvent, right? There's no reagent. There's no, we need to figure out how to think about water in biology. And, you know, when we're thinking about the origin of life on Earth, this is why we need to think about water. You know, I mean, how did this happen? Where did this come from? Why is water so deeply buried in biochemistry? And I think any origin of life model has to account for the role of water we see in extant biology. So, uh, this has sort of gone, gone over a little bit, but when we think about the origin of life, well, the model we sort of favor involves surfaces. And we don't think a surface really looked like this. We think on the ancient Earth, you know, Catlin and these people will tell us there's like organic snow. Just, so this is not, in that sense, this is not a good model, but the idea is on surfaces, when you have a spinning planet, you have cycling water activity. The water activity goes up and down and up and down on a 24 hour cycle. And this naturally pulls water in and out of molecules, right? So you can do condensation and hydrolysis. Reactions just start going back and forth and back and forth. Then you don't need biochemistry to do this, right? This is just the chemistry of the surface when you have a, a complex mixture of organic molecules. Some of them are going to have hydroxyl groups and carboxylic acids and amines, and they are going to just start condensing and hydrolyzing. So for us, this is the initiation of biology, is this condensation chemistry on the surface. But it's not just surface. So, okay, so I'm trying, trying to talk about you know, what to look for on other planets. There's a lot of ways of doing thermodynamic cycling of water, right? There's freeze-thaw cycling. There, this is, we're talking about a day-night cycle here, but there's also seasonal cycles. You know, there's many ways that you can thermodynamically cycle water in order to achieve this. Uh, you know, the, the day-night cycle on a spinning planet, I think, is kind of the easiest, but there's, there's many other ways you can cycle water activity and achieve this sort of effect. Okay, how am I doing for time? Five minutes. Uh, five minutes, okay, I have one more, and I want to change subject again. Never try to get three talks in half an hour. It's not a good thing. Okay. Oh, well, so this is my conclusion, actually. If this one is, you know, our planet, or any spinning planet in sort of what we call a habitable zone, is basically like a PCR machine. Only, you know, the PCR machine cycles temperature, but our planet, you know, temperature is cycling, hydration is cycling. I mean, there's so many thermodynamic cycles going on on our, on our planet, and I would say, you know, a tidally locked planet is, you know, the whole thermodynamic cycling environment is going to be fundamentally different and fundamentally less interesting. So we would say maybe one of the biosignatures you want is a, well, or let's say a, a habitable environment would be a planet with water, but not too much water. If it's an ocean planet, it's not going to work very well. And it can't be tidally locked. So for us, that would be the kind of environment for you Planetary scientists, go find that one, and then, then we can go find biology somewhere. Okay, I want to talk about, now I want to talk to the, 
young people here who are just starting out their career and want to talk about models and data and something in the orbit of life. So um, let me just tell you this. Last night I was talking to one of my graduate students about thermal cycling. You know, I've, I've, I'm into thermal cycling. And all of a sudden I said, don't listen to me. I said, I'm an old scientist. I have been captured by my model. I think rather than talking about science, I'm talking about my model. And I'm so in love with my model that I cannot be rational about it. And um, I think this is a problem that scientists obviously have. I mean, there's that we fall in love with our models and we lose the ability to distinguish them from reality. In fact, when you see scientists arguing about things, they're not really arguing about science. Generally, they're arguing about their model and each of them is attached to some model and then they're arguing about whose model is best. And, and you know, scientists become captured by their models. They, you know, you fall in love with your model and you invest a lot, you know? Like I've invested personally a lot in wet-dry cycling. I mean, I have grants, I have papers, and you know, if all of a sudden somebody comes and says wet-dry cycling has no validity, I'm like sad, right? So that's, you know, that's, so for I'd say a young person, you need to, you know, when you join a lab, you're gonna start working for a person like me who is enamored with their model. And you know, you can easily fall into this trap of not have, you know, you don't have the sort of background to distinguish and to understand what's going on. And then after five years, all of a sudden you're captured by that model and you didn't even know it. Right? So, you know, in the origin of life, we have all these models. We have RNA world, thermal mass, protein world, Darwin's bond, I have this here. And one one thing I, I also believe, and I, is that to a uh, hammer, everything looks like a nail. So what, what I mean is that to a, geo a geologist love thermal vents, right? They like rocks, right? <laughs> organic chemists like organic chemistry. And I'm a biochemist, so I have other things. But you know, the, the model we like, you know, kind of comes from our training. And you can see that all over the origin of life, you know, in, in our community. And, I guess to the young people, I just want to say, I mean, you got to go work for somebody, right? Uh, but, you know, you need to talk to the people they don't like. I guess that's one thing. You know, get, get exposed to, you know, figure out the weaknesses of the model and make sure you're, you're aware of the model, the environment you're working in. Um, so, okay, I just want to, let me, I am going to talk about some models, but I'm not. But let me, okay, one more thing. There's something that I hear all the time. I've heard it at this meeting, and you hear it, and it is so seductive that we just cannot escape it. And I, where people will say, this thing is so important in biology, it must have to do with the origin of life. I've heard it at this meeting, you hear it all the time. And I mean, RNA, is, you know, it catalyzes chemical reactions, it's informational, it's so important in extant biology. It must be important in the origin of life. Okay, so I just want to show you something here. Just look at this. This is a, a phone. Let's all of us look at our phones. They're going to look like this, right? They're going to have touch screens and things like this. But then let's look at the ancestry of that phone. And then let's look at the ancestry of that phone. So if we all looked at our cell phones and we said, oh, they all have touch screens. Touch screens must be very important in the origin of communication, right? We would be wrong. We would be wrong, okay? And, uh, you know, this is, it is so seductive to say, oh, RNA is so important in biology that it must be important in the origin of life. Okay, that is not true, okay? It might, I'm not saying it's not important, but that logic that you're using is incorrect logic. And this is, you know, this is something people who, Stephen Jay Gould has written an entire book on this called The Structure of, uh, The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, in which he says over and over again, you cannot infer ancestry by excellent structure and function. So this is this is a known thing in evolution, but it is not known in the origin of life. And it, I think it causes, well, I just think you need to think clearly. And this also, people adopt the model based on this incorrect logic, and then they will devote their life to that model. So don't do that. At least in my model, you should not do that. Okay, I'm good. Uh, thank you guys for listening to me. And uh, I think that's it.
not understood about, for example, your ATP example being used as currency to drive reactions upstream. There is a theory in physics or physical chemistry maybe of non-equilibrium uh, chemical reactions, of cycles, of where, of how much energy usage you need to run things uphill, and uh, it works. Yeah. It explains, you know, active polarization out of equilibrium. It explains all those things. I'm not exactly sure what you're looking for that's not present in the existing theory. Okay. Of those. Well. Yeah. I guess I would say it like this. You know, we have theory, we can describe water molecules, but those, that theory does not explain liquid water, right? And I think if you look at biology, you say, for example, the ubiquity of glucose. Everything in biology shares glucose, right? And, and everything in biology uses ATP as an energy currency, except that's not true, because UTP is used as an energy currency for synthesized cellulose. So, I, I'm not saying those things are wrong, but I don't think they explain, I don't think they help us. I don't think they, I think that, that, bi, that biothermodynamics or bio, biological energy is, uh, the way energy is, is on an emergent level that is not explained by just saying I have a bunch of coupled reactions and I can push something uphill because of that sort of classical thermodynamics. Uh, you know, in biology, we have, okay, for example, there's thousands of reactions that are all coupled. And they all share ATP. Okay, this is so. This is it's just happening. The same thing is happening, but it's on a different level that gives you different outcomes. That's that's sort of what I'm thinking. I mean, I guess it's like this. You can, ex or you, or or you, I guess the, the, this, maybe let me say it like this. This classical thermodynamic model does not really tell us why biology is fundamentally different from the rest of the universe that we know of. Right? It doesn't. It just says you can couple reactions and push something uphill. That does not explain the ribosome and all this complexity. So we need sure. a model that, that tells us what is happening, I guess. Okay. Anyway, over here. All right. So, Andre, thank you so much for such a provocative talk. Because you need a lot of okay, that's, that's a bad sign. Okay, now <laughs> it's <laughs> <laughs> so interesting. Good job. And, you know, I have to, I, I am a trained physicist, so I have to say, you know, for your last example, it's the electricity. So RNA is like the electricity, okay? And like once you figure out the RNA, it's just so pivotal that all of your telephones and telegraphs are looking the other way. So um, it's, it's something that's one of and I'm happy that I found it. Yeah. I mean, I would say water is like the electricity of water. Water is the underlying thing. So, you know, um, I don't think our, yeah, <laughs> so we can argue this. <laughs> um, hi, Lauren. Um, this is Su uh, from UT Austin. Where are you? Uh, here. Okay, hi. Hey. Um, so, oh, first of all, yeah, thanks for a like, very um, you know, thought provoking talk, um, which includes a lot of um, speculations. I just want to add some questions on top of it. Um, so I'm, yeah, I was trained as a physical chemist, but now I have a kind of molecular biophysics, so I have some kind of a physical view um, of the first part of your um, questions or speculations regarding uh, how the, the things are self-assembled so smoothly uh, to uh, facilitate uh, complicated things. You draw like a kind of a linear scaffold connecting the heterogeneous components. Um, what's the... Um, I mean, how does it, how, how is it represented by, like, what, what is the scaffold you think, and I think, uh, um, so, so one example, like, uh, instead of just a linear scaffold or some kind of a molecular scaffold, um, it's a kind of a eukaryotic system, specifically. Um, there could be some, part, uh, there could be some um, similar phenomenon in prokaryotic system, but like, uh, Currently, in a um, molecular um, biophysical um, field, many people are interested in like a little bit of separation, which are driven by um, these um, proteins and RNAs, and naturally they are from the clusters, which are speculated to uh, facilitate the uh, um, transcription or translation, any kind of things. Do you have any um, kind of, um, you know, your um, opinions about um, are they actually helping the reactions to occur inside the clusters or they're just happening in the background? Well, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, could you just re 
restate that question, but I'm not sure I've actually understood the question or got the question. So basically you described the, I think you simply um, put the things together toward the entropy related. So we're talking about the first, my first little thing I was talking about, that first yes. part? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you know, the things are like very um, compartmentalized in our system to yeah. facilitate lots of functions, but like um, they are not just um, getting organized by just a, not just by ATP, but they have some natural propensity to come together to have some reaction or um, biophysical, bio, biochemical processes including the mRNA synthesis or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, do you have a Okay, idea? yeah, okay, I understand what you're saying. And you know, this is, I mean, this is the way I think about it. If you look at an amino acid or a nucleotide or glucose, I mean, these molecules essentially, in one sense, are not functional, right? Function is an emergent property of polymerization, right? Like bases do not pair. If you have monomer C and G in solution, they don't form base pairs, right? Or, you know, so, you know, these functions are emergent or on polymerization. So I would say no, that these properties of assembly are, are you know, until you polymerize a protein in the right sequence, you know, it, no, it's not going to fold, and you're not going to get, like, so I'm, I, I don't know, is that answering your question? Uh, we can, we can okay, we can talk later, sorry. Is this in the last one? Um, great talk. Very provocative, but to me that means uh, <laughs> a big compliment. I like that. So basically, ATP, as a physicist, I'm really recently fascinated by ATP. Uh, in the environments that David Catlin described before, Borimer and others, where there is a <coughs> phosphate in the solution and you have concentration get a lot of ATP, just like you say there is a lot of it, and it's very stable in those environments because very stable against UV uh, radiation it turns out as well. So um, in addition to your best of interesting properties, I recently understood that people like Tony Hyman and Timona Christian have both then actually shown that ATP is also a condensation agent in these environments. It's a so in your lipid yes. things, it can actually concentrate other molecules and exactly. create yet another kind of dry wet like condensation yes. uh, cycle for the water. So uh, have you worked on that? Uh, we, I haven't worked on it, but I've thought about it a lot. And I, I'll just say what it's saying is like ATP is the energy currency, but it also has a lot of, it has other functions. ATP is a hydrotrope that um, promotes protein folding and has all kinds of it's like a it's like an amphipath that is too too small to form like a, a micelle or something, but it has some really amazing uh, influences on protein folding, right? And so, but I think this is this is the nature of biology that um, you know, like tRNA is used in translation, but it's also fragmented and used in gene expression, right? Everything things get used and used and have multiple functions and. ATP, if that's true for ATP also, it's kind of, it's I think what you expect. Um, something that's old and it's been around for a long time is gonna do a lot of things. Um, but as far as the origin, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think ATP forms sort of spontaneously under any uh, prebiotic model. It does it? I mean, you can't, you can make, no, yeah, so ATP is not a, a molecule that can just form spontaneously under any prebiotic scenario. Maybe someday, but not, not now. Luke Rothschild, other guys, too. That was fabulously interesting talk, and obviously I need to change, again, these are great reasons why water, um, so fantastic. Um, on the ATP, I'm wondering if you could take the economic um, analogy further that really you, you're describing an inflationary model, and why don't you then have some reactions that are cheaper or, or have that evolution towards cells that are, that are more efficient with their $10 bills? Um, and, and just for your answer, one other sort of quick comment on the end, and that is I'm not quite sure your analogy is correct going from the from the telegraph to the cell phone because we haven't had to re-evolve and really change our system. 
But if you're part of the tight ecology like you have with the biochemical reaction, it would be more like saying, sure, you can have this wonderful cell phone, but you're going to have to grow three arms and two more eyeballs, and the cost is just too great to bother switching, so you can make a better telegraph instead. Yeah, um, okay, I take that. In fact, my nephew uh, worked for Verizon and was involved in the switching from landlines. He directed 3,000 programmers and switched from landlines to cell phones, and it was an enormous, you're right, it was very difficult. So, I don't, that's, that's you're, you're missing another example there, by the way, because if you remember the, uh, um, all the, uh, you know, handheld devices that had the actual touch pads, right. that were physical touch pads, and BlackBerry went out of business because they did not believe that right. electronic touch yeah. pads there's, oh yeah, there's flip phones, there's many, I saw this was a coarse grain evolutionary model I showed you. So, uh, okay, there's a, there's a question there, Vincent? Uh, Vincent, you know, it's going to be so hard. Uh, no, and thank you uh, for your talk. Uh, I'm not a very chemist, you are, so you know, that's better than me, but if I remember correctly, the way the index of energy in a cell in biological system is the adenylate energy charge. It is not the, the, the just the concentration of ATP that was introduced by Atkinson in the 60s. You have a lot of ATP, not because you need a lot of ATP, you have a lot of ATP because you have also a lot of AMP and ATP. And that is going to push your real index of energy much lower. Can you make a, a comment about that? I, I, I disagree that ATP is just a currency. It is the adenylate energy charge. That's your real index of energy. Okay, well, the reason why there's more, there's so much ATP, I guess, is controversial. There is one model that there's a lot of ATP because it's a hydrotrope, and that it, it solubilizes proteins, it prevents protein, mis or it, it helps prevent protein misfolding and things like that. So, I mean, maybe there's some dynamic arguments. I guess I don't know the real reason. But, what, but effectively, the, the result of it is that essentially anything is possible, and, you know, you don't... Like, when I lift my arm, what am I doing? I'm hydrolyzing ATP. I can do it whenever I want. Biology can build whatever it wants because it has this, it's like having a machine on the side just making this stuff and uh, you can use it for whatever you want. And that's, you know, I, I think this distinguishes biology from other thermodynamic processes in the natural world. I'm not sure that the, the actual amount of ATP is really, um, sort of bears on that issue. So, so I feel obliged to make another comment because you have a sort of binary review, either delta G being positive or delta G being negative, and you're right. If you have enough ATP, delta G is in the right direction and you're fine, but there's also a rate depends on how much above that you are. It's not just a question of can it occur or can it not occur, it's a question of the speed at which it occurs. So you also can adjust to how high your ATP that makes your downhill part faster or lowers your having to go over a large energy barrier, so it's, it, it could be a quantitative issue. Yeah, well, I mean, you're talking, I'm talking about thermodynamics, you're talking about kinetics. You know, there's an allosteric, I mean, yes, things are regulated, there's allosterisms, there's all way, kinds of ways that rates, in fact, I would call that another part of this kind of uh, instrument is that, you know, one of the things that differentiates biology from other things is that all the reactions happen at the same temperature. Right, that's another, I think, kind of emergent property of bio. So, you know, you have all these, I, I call them, I've decided to call them like instruments. It's like, okay, let me just give you an analogy. If we are in a barter economy, we can't build a skyscraper. If we have a modern economy with credit cards and loans and things, we can build skyscrapers. And biology builds skyscrapers. Biology is the only system that we know of that can build skyscrapers. And the question is, how does it do that? And it does that, I think, with thermodynamic instruments that are not available outside of biology. Okay, one last question. Well, uh, the Great Pyramid is the largest uh, object. OK, slaves don't count. It wasn't just a religious obligation. Well, thanks. So carrying on our whiskey-fueled conversation from last night, um, you know, the message I get, of course, is the message that we've been hearing a lot of the meeting is the idea of emergence. And in this case, uh, it's emergence of life, but analogously, it's the emergence of planetary systems. If you take a molecular cloud, collapse it, make a star on planets, 
If you model that, you never get the solar system. Never. So nature obviously made planets. Life is obviously here. So you get planets, which are kind of like the, the minimum thing in, in, for a planetary environment. And you get, what, what is the minimum emergence thing for life? as you call the energy currency, as some of us talked about, information, and so on. So if we just want to understand planets by looking at what nature made, how about understanding life by looking at what nature made in this circumstance? And then going back and asking ourselves, what are the minimum emergent properties of that life? And I think it's something you can apply to your telephone now, it's something that you can apply to planet formation, and I'm beginning to suspect it's something that we can apply to living systems. So comments on that. Okay, yeah, that's, I think, a really great comment. And I, I think, you know, the, our problem is, I mean, we got the best brains. I'm talking about humans, not just us in this room. <laughs> we got the best brains uh, on the planet, but still they're pretty small. And, they're, and what we do is we tend to think, like some people say, biology is information, biology is replication, or biology is some thermodynamic thing. I mean, we're capable of thinking about one thing at a time, and I don't think biology ever thought about one thing at a time. You know, if you look at evolution, it can do many, many things together. You know, all sorts of things happen. They're linked, like your, the evolution of the mitochondrion and the evolution of the nucleus, are, they happen together. Biology, and I would say even the ancestry to biology, stitches all kinds of things together. And so when we say, where did information come from? We can't really answer that question without saying, where did an energy currency come from? You can't have information without an energy currency. You can't, you can't have translation without transcription. You can't have transcription without replication. I mean. All of these things, we, you know, we want to think about, everybody wants to say, oh, my model of life is replication first, or my model of life is this first, or that first. I think all those models are wrong. You know, biology, and I think protobiology, many things. There's, there were no chickens and no eggs. Everything kind of came together. And but, your, but your argument is then against forward modeling. Well, I'm saying it's a difficult question. I mean, I'm not, you know, and that when we think about these one-dimensional approaches, like a lot of times people talk about replication, and then they become obsessed by the RNA world, and they think the RNA world explains everything because all biology is all about replication, right? And obviously replication is important, but, you know, you can't have RNA without, without transcription. But all of those are forward modeling steps from, from initial ingredients. So are you really saying that we have to back model because we're, tr we're trying to reproduce something that happened in nature without telling nature what to do, which we yeah. never ever do. Well, I guess what I'm th saying is that before we do anything, we have to think straight. And then we have to figure it out later. I mean, we, you know, first we have to think straight. And I think a lot, when I look at the origin of life, you know, it's, you know, people, they adopt some model even like RNA world, I was talking to Matt about this yesterday, and I mean, most of us believe the RNA world is not a reasonable model, and yet it will never go away, right? And I mean, if we're not thinking straight, I mean, as a community, I just don't think, and before we do any of these things, we first have to think straight. Yeah, remember, there's a difference between belief and understanding. Right? Totally. Yeah. Okay, anyway, it sounds like this is yet another one of those conversations best done in the bar. Uh, uh, so, uh, Thank you very much for it. Thank you guys. Thank you.